Today's talk is on group one, two, three, and four pulmonary hypertension diagnostic and treatment guidelines. My name is Zina Saftar. I am an associate professor of medicine at Vail Cornell Houston Methodist Hospital in Houston. The learning objectives of today's talk are outlined over here to basically improve our understanding uh, of the diagnostic and clinical parameters of how to make the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, which is a very important topic, and then to understand the pathophysiologic mechanisms which are relevant. And then when do we treat these patients, whether treating group two and three pH patients is good, relevant, is going to make a difference and then review the factors which are important in, in this disease management of this complex disease. I think number one point is to understand the hemodynamic definition of pulmonary hypertension. It's pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension when the mean pulmonary artery pressure is more than 20 millimeter of mercury. This is the updated guidelines which uh, decrease the mean PA pressure from 25 millimeter of mercury to 20 millimeter of mercury. In the previous guidelines, it was 25. So the reason why they decrease it to 20 is to increase the amount of patients who are can be diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension and also to capture those patients with early pH. The wedge pressure has to be less than 15 millimeter of mercury and the PVR has to be greater than 3 millimeter of mercury to classify as precapillary pulmonary hypertension. And in this group, you would have group 1, 3, 4 and 5 and we are going to go over these groups in, a, in a just a few minutes. Now, the post-capillary pulmonary hypertension or uh, that associated with left heart disease has the same uh, diagnostic parameter of mean pulmonary artery pressure of more than 20 millimeter of mercury, but the wedge pressure or LVEDP is more than 15 millimeter of mercury and the PVR is less than three. Of course, there are many patients who fall into the category of combined pre and post pulmonary hypertension and that becomes a diagnostic challenge and also a treatment challenge of how to manage these patients. So the reason why the, the 25 millimeter of mercury was dropped down to 20 is because of this large study in which more than 2,500 patients uh, data was reviewed. And you can see that patients who have uh, uh, not only mean PAP of more than 25, but also patients who have a mean pulmonary artery pressure between 19 to 24 millimeter of mercury, even that is a bad diagnostic, bad survival uh, for these patients. So in order to, to also treat these patients, the, the diagnostic criteria was reduced as compared to your normal pressure, which is less than 18 millimeter of mercury. So as you can imagine, right heart cath is, is very important. And this is again showing that as the mean PA pressure increases, the walk distance decreases, the mortality increases, so it's on the whole, having a pressure more than uh, 20 millimeter of mercury is, is a bad thing for patients. This is what I was talking about in terms of group one and group two. So, so this is all group one, which is idiopathic, if it runs in the family, if it's associated with drug and toxins, if uh, there are connective tissue disease associated uh, patients such as lupus, scleroderma, rheumatoid arthritis, HIV patients can develop it also. Though it's rare, it's about 0.5%. Uh, so out of 200 patients, one patient would have it. Whereas in connective tissue disease, about 20 to 30% of patients will develop pulmonary hypertension. Liver disease is an important factor in patients who have portal hypertension, not just cirrhosis. If they have ascites, evidence of portal hypertension, such as um, varices, ascites, um, GI bleed, those patients will develop pulmonary hypertension. Patients who have ASD, VSD, which is uh, quite common, uh, especially in, in Pakistan, they may develop uh, pulmonary hypertension also. So those are the most common causes. The group two one uh, are the, the group two are the left heart disease, which can be because of preserved LVEF or left ventricular ejection fraction uh, or reduced uh, ejection fraction, or it could be because of valvular disease such as mitral stenosis, um, aortic stenosis or aortic regurg. And then group three are the left uh, is the lung disease or hypoxemia, such as obstructive lung disease, restrictive ILD, ILDs, um, IPF, uh, mixed obstructive restrictive, 
and just hypoxemia can is a very potent trigger for pulmonary vasoconstriction that can lead to pulmonary hypertension and we're going to talk about that a little later also so um, other cause is group four which is your chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension not just an acute pe but chronic uh, pe's which then become incorporated into the pulmonary vasculature and lead to pulmonary hypertension and then of course group five is the multifactorial un unclear etiology such as sarcoidosis included in this um, collagen uh, sorry, hematological malignancies uh, such as Gaucher's disease, sickle cell is included in it also, which is quite common in Pakistan. So type of uh, pulmonary hypertension, as I mentioned, if it's a lung is problem, then this is the group, uh, group three. If it's post capillary, that's your group two. If the problem is clots, uh, chronic clots, then that is your thromboembolic, that's um, your group four. Whereas if it's idiopathic or associated, that's your uh, group one pulmonary hypertension. Another way of looking at it is this, this is if you consider the whole vasculature as a, as a tube and the pressure, the blood is flowing from, from the RA to the RV to the pulmonary vasculature, gets oxygenated and goes into the pulmonary vein, into the left atrium and left ventricle and through the aorta into the systemic circulation. And if there's a problem over here, that's your group two pulmonary hypertension, which creates back pressure and leads to high uh, elevation in pressure in the pulmonary vasculature that ultimately leads to pressure, back pressure into the RA and RV. So the problem with that and the treatment of that is going to be just treat the, the valvular problem or left heart problem that is causing, causing the main issue. And this is a, uh, an interesting slide, uh, which is uh, showing you, the figure shows you on the x-axis, which is over here, cardiac output. And on the y-axis is the mean pulmonary artery pressure. As you can see, the cardiac output increases. The pulmonary artery pressure relatively stays the same. Like if you go to the gym and do exercise, a normal cardiac output is around five. You can double it to 10 or even triple it to 15. The pulmonary artery pressure don't increase, it stays the same. But there is a small minority of patients in which the vasculature uh, is compromised so that increase in cardiac output leads to PA pressures and they become symptomatic, short of breath, and they can't exercise. Uh, and they are okay at rest or minimum exercise, but any amount of strenuous activity can uh, then unmask their limitation. This is group one PAH, that the relevance uh, is uh, the, the, uh, the presence of pre uh, prevalence of the disease is about 100,000, but uh, it has been more diagnosed more recently. There are many patients who are being diagnosed with it. Uh, majority of the patients are idiopathic, which means you do the workup and nothing is found. And the second most common is the connective tissue disease, which is also common in, in Pakistan. Uh, lupus scleroderma is a common cause of pulmonary hypertension and these patients should be screened. Other causes, of course, is liver disease and drug abuse and HIV. And you can see over here, this is a, uh, the, the slide. This is the um, uh, lung section showing you the pulmonary vessel. And inside, the lumen is completely obliterated by this lesion known as plexiform lesion in which there are these, um, these small slit-like lumens, but no real lumen is there. There may be a thrombus there too. And as more and more lung gets involved with these lesions, the right heart failure happens. We went over this uh, previously, and uh, as you can see in a vessel, as the as a, normally the vessel is very thin walled, the pulmonary small pulmonary arteries or the arterioles they are thin walled, but and with the with uh, with the blood flow going through it. And as we exercise or increase our cardiac output, these are capacitance vessels which can dilate and incorporate the amount of blood flow. But in pulmonary hypertension, as the vessel wall becomes thickened, you can see that the whole lumen, it's not just the lumen that's, uh, that is uh, becoming thickened, but the whole of the vessel wall, the, the adventitia, the media, and the intima, all of the vessel wall are becoming thickened. There is all, also a in situ thrombus that is present in this vessel and as it becomes more complex these uh, comp uh, plexiform lesion form and patients develop shortness of breath even at rest 
And there's a lot of uh, dysfunction that's happening. It's not just the vasoconstriction, vasodilation. As you can see, the whole of the vessel wall is compromised. And there is a lot of proliferative uh, factors which go into play in addition to mitochondrial dysfunction and inflammation. And excessive vascular remodeling happens, uh, leading to in, uh, increased pulmonary vascular resistance. And it is the sustained vasoconstriction over a period of time, years, that leads to vascular remodeling. And in a patient that comes to us, we have to take a complete history uh, and do a complete physical and then rule out those causes, as I mentioned, make sure they don't have any lung disease, make sure they don't have any heart disease. The most important um, screening tool for these patients is an echocardiogram, ultrasound of the heart, which is very important. You can do a chest X-ray or a CT scan if you want to be uh, more uh, detailed about it. A perfusion scan is normally done to rule out chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And then the right heart cath has to be done in every patient to make sure that the mean pulmonary artery pressure is more than 20, not 25 as written over here, and the wedge pressure is less than 15, and the PVR is more than 3. And then we have to figure out what the cause is. And this is the diagnostic um, uh, kind of test that we normally do. We do uh, serologies to make sure they don't have liver disease, connective tissue disease. We also do a PFT, complete PFT to look out for obstruction and the CO2 retention in these patients. And symptoms uh, of disease is very um, uh, non-specific, uh, shortness of breath, fatigue, weakness, syncope is usually a terminal or advanced disease uh, patients will have uh, pre-syncope or syncope passing out episodes is a very bad prognostic sign. On physical examination, there might be evidence of uh, right ventricular hypertrophy, there will be RV heave. Uh, there is a uh, loud P2 at the apex, there is uh, systolic murmurs, and of course, a uh, jugular uh, uh, distension, venous distension. And this is an echocardiogram showing you that near the probe is your left side, left ventricle, and over here is the right ventricle and the right um, uh, atrium. And you can see that the right side is more... Um, dilated versus the left side, which is which is not dilated, and it is the interventricular septum is actually uh, bowing towards the left side, which is on the right side of your screen and near the V. So right heart uh, catheterization is the gold standard to confirm the diagnosis of these patients with pulmonary hypertension. And as we go through the different chambers of the heart, you can see that the 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 uh, the tracings uh, becomes different, and the RA is usually pressures around eight to ten. And as it becomes the goes into your catheter advances into the RV, you will have a systolic uptake. There's an increase in systolic pressure, and as the catheter goes into the pulmonary artery, there's a diastolic uh, increase in pressure. And then as the, the catheter further advances into a wedge position, there is going to be a dampening or a decrease in, in, in this uh, systolic uptake. And as you deflate the balloon, it should go, go back to your normal PA catheter tracing. So according to the uh, uh, reveal registry, I mean, we know that uh, there is a diagnostic delay between the onset of symptoms and the, the right heart cat and diagnosis. And usually, in the review reg registry is the largest registry of, uh, of patients, about more than 3,500 patients, actually. And there's a diagnostic delay of about uh, three years between the onset of symptoms and right heart cath. And that is still, uh, uh, it still happens. Even now, I see patients who have gone to a couple of doctors before they actually come to us, and or they are poorly treated and uh, hardly on any medication before and they are, they are already far advanced uh, when they are referred finally to a pH center or pH expert. It's important, of course, to uh, get them uh, on a diuretic, give them oxygen if they are hypoxic, send them to a clinic if there, if there is a clinic available to handle these pH patients or to a physician who actually can manage these complex patients.
and the battery uh, uh, which have been targeted uh, and led to development of drugs the, or medication to treat pulmonary hypertension are actually three pathways. One is the endothelial pathway, nitric oxide pathway, and the prostacyclin pathway. And the endothelial pathway is upregulated. There's a lot of endothelin being expressed and shedded and increased level in the bloodstream. So if you give them endothelin blocker, that's going to block this potent vasoconstrictor, which is endothelin, and it will decrease the decrease the proliferation because it's also a proliferative agent. On the other hand, if you have nitric oxide pathway, there's decrease in nitric oxide levels in these patients. So if you give them exogenous nitric oxide, which is as yet not possible. On the other hand, if you can give them something that increases the cyclic GMP, which is the end product of nitric oxide, then you can increase the levels and cause vasodilation. And for that effect, we give phosphodiesterase inhibitors for these patients. And prostacyclin pathway is the other one which is also decreased. So if you give them exogenous prostacyclin, that will be vasodilation and antiproliferation that will result. So the treatment algorithm for these patients is that we uh, get a treatment naive patient, we do the workup that I talked about, we do a right heart cath, and during the right heart cath, we do give them uh, either nitric oxide or um, you, if you don't have uh, a nitric oxide, you can give them adenosine to create, uh, to see if there's reduction in pressures, and if there is, then you can give them a calcium channel blocker, but if it's not, which is present in about 90% or 95% of patients, there's no change, then you have to risk stratify them. And if the risk is low, you can give them dual therapy. But if the risk is high, then you have to give them triple or three drugs uh, uh, very fast and refer them for lung transplantation. And this is just a time course of how the uh, different trials have been completed and different uh, studies uh, that have been completed and different medications which have come into play. You can see that in 2000, we only had one or two drugs available. 10 years later, we had a few more, and now we have up to about 14 drugs which are available uh, for patients with pulmonary hypertension. And it's important to, uh, to, uh, to, and this is just a list of all the medications which are available, epiprostenil or Flolan, this is the intravenous therapy, triprostenil, um, is a remodulin, it can be sub QIV or inhaled form or even in a, in a tablet or capsule form. And selective pack is the, the IP receptor agonist, uh, the prostacyclin receptor agonist, which is also oral. On the other hand, uh, in, bosentan is available, but it does affect the liver, and uh, that's the endothelial pathway. And for that, patients have to have liver function testing done every month. Embrisentan though it does not require the liver. Um, uh, uh, monitoring that closely, but we usually do it every three months. Uh, Opsimet or mesitentin is the, is the newer ERA which is available. Now, nitric oxide pathway, we have uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors such as sildenafil and tadalafil, whereas the newer one is the guanylase cyclic stimulator, which also works through the same way and it's called Riosigwat. So um, according to this, uh, if patients who are not calcium channel blocker candidate, they should be started depending on how bad they are. If they're function class three, they should be on two drugs at least, and function class four should be uh, started on intravenous therapy and, uh, and at least four drugs, sorry, three drugs in combination. So I wanted to touch base on the group two, uh, sorry, group three pulmonary hypertension, which is your COPD. And these patients are, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the pH is out of proportion to the amount of uh, lung disease that's present. And you can see that patients with severe uh, COPD actually uh, have a mean pulmonary artery pressure of around 20 to 30. So majority of the patients will have, this is one of the study, again, this is group three pulmonary hypertension. It's a typo that said group two, it's group three is your lung disease pulmonary hypertension. These patients, some of them actually have a very high mean pulmonary artery pressure, but majority have mild pulmonary hypertension. And as their pulmonary artery pressure uh, goes up, as, as they, they have comorbidities uh, such as PAH with COPD, their um, uh, mortality or survival reduces. 
And if you stratify these patients according to the mean pulmonary artery pressure of about 25 to 39 or uh, more than 40, you can see that in patients with group 3 pulmonary hypertension, worse outcome happens in patients who have a pH with COPD with higher mean pulmonary artery pressures. And what do we do for these patients to, you know, you have, they have to stop smoking, vaping, hookah, whatever they're doing, they need to stop that because there's a genetic predisposition to these patients who develop endothelial dysfunction. Hypoxia is a, is a trigger for profound pulmonary vasoconstriction and vascular remodeling leading to pulmonary hypertension. So any patient who have a severe shortness of breath, they, are, they have to have the lung function test done, including diffusion capacity, uh, CT scan, echocardiogram. And if there's any evidence of uh, left heart disease, sleep apnea, interstitial lung disease, that needs to be treated. And if they don't have those and the degree of pulmonary hypertension is severe, then these patients do need a right heart cap. Over here, it says that uh, the same, as I mentioned, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. When that happens, then the blood flow is uh, diverted from that area. And uh, that leads to, uh, to increase in the, in the CO2 in these patients. So if you give them some oxygen, but not too much, because if you give them, if they have increased uh, PCO2 and you give them oxygen, then you will take away the um, hypoxic drive. So these patients should not be given too much oxygen. But if you give them, if you give, if they are hypoxic and you give them adequate ventilation in the area which is being perfused, then they will have enough blood flow to that area, which will have ventilation and which will have perfusion. So you can see over here that over a period of time, as patients are hypoxic, acutely it's not going to have a problem, but a chronic hypoxemia lead to vascular remodeling and pulmonary hypertension. This is a landmark study known as NOT and the Medical Research Council MRC study, both of them showing that in patients who are using oxygen, even if they use oxygen um, for 15 hours a day, as compared to not using oxygen, both these studies show that there's increased survival in patients who use oxygen and they have COPD. So long-term oxygen therapy is very much important in patients with group three pulmonary hypertension. And of course, if they, if they are using oxygen and their baseline pulmonary artery pressure is low, then they will have better survival as compared to high pulmonary artery pressure. So the indication for long-term oxygen therapy is uh, different in different countries, different in different areas, but the main uh, gist of the slide is that if the patient has, has low oxygen, saturation is less than 90, and they have, they have uh, evidence of uh, uh, hypoxia, peripheral edema, pulmonary hypertension, increase in hematic rate, polycythemia, all these are, uh, are important indicators. Any patient who have less than 88%, they need to be on oxygen. If their saturation is less than 88%, they need to be on oxygen. If the patient have bad lung function, such as FEV1 of less than uh, 30 to 49%, if there is presence of cyanosis, then they need to be on oxygen. They should be prescribed oxygen. So pH specific therapy, a patient who have severe pulmonary hypertension with COPD, those patients can be considered for pH specific therapy. But again, if their oxygen requirement goes up because what, what we are doing by giving them a pulmonary vasodilator, we are shunting the blood uh, flow to the area which is not oxygenated, then their oxygen requirement will go up. I had a patient who was on two liters of oxygen. Somebody gave them one uh, pH medication, then another pH medication. Their oxygen requirement went from two to six liters that uh, they came back to me and what I did was I took them uh, took those medications away and their oxygen, oxygen requirement went back to two liters. So what we were doing was not actually helping them, but also that increased amount of vasodilation was actually shunting the blood away from the area which is being ventilated. So uh, this is just uh, the same thing. You, you have to do the right heart cat, find out what the problem is, where the problem lies, if it is the lung parenchyma that's the problem, or is it, 
is it their um, their uh, COPD or emphysema causing a problem? This is one study looking at Bosentan uh, to treat patients with uh, with uh, COPD, and you can see that there was no difference uh, in patients who were given Bosentan uh, at 12 weeks as compared to baseline. And sildenafil also, uh, there was no change in the oxygen saturation when they were given sildenafil in COPD patients, and there was no change really in the in the exercise uh, oxygen saturation or even in their six minute walk uh, distance, which means how much they can walk in a six minute. What about inhaled nitric oxide? Well, inhaled NO is not readily available, but in this study, they did have it available and they gave it. And you can see that in addition to oxygen, if you give them NO, their uh, pr pulmonary pressures go down and the PVR go down also when you give them both NO and, and um, oxygen. This is a study in which patients were given inhaled triprostanol and uh, which is an inhaled form and and then uh, uh, they, they were followed and these patients had group three pulmonary hypertension on the ct scan which means they have lung disease but they met the criteria for pulmonary hypertension the previous criteria and then they were randomized to receive the inhaled triprostanil which is a prosocycline versus placebo and you can see that their walk distance improved as compared to four, week four. Their walk distance improved uh, uh, by about 15 meters. So over here, their walk distance improved about 16 meters and 15 meters. So there was improvement in walk distance <clears throat> as compared to baseline. And this is another device uh, which in which they inhale nitric oxide. Uh, it, it, put, it generates uh, inhaled nitric oxide from ambient air. It's this, this study uh, is looking at uh, uh, giving uh, these patients with pulmonary fibrosis who are on long term oxygen to give them inhaled nitric oxide. Um, and this is a small portable device, uh, not not too heavy uh, to carry. And, and they're looking at different doses of nitric oxide and looking at the outcome. So in summary, uh, for group three pulmonary hypertension, it is, uh, the, uh, the, um, it is hemodynamically defined disease. Hypoxia is a correctable risk factor. Oxygen is important for these patients. If they have severe pulmonary hypertension, then give them oxygen. If they're anemic, treat their anemia, which can, be, uh, which can increase the oxygen carrying capacity for these patients. Treat the lung disease. If they have obstruction, give them inhalers, bronchodilators. There's really no role for pulmonary hypertension specific therapy as of yet for these patients. Now, what about group two, which is uh, the left heart disease? This is a study looking at um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which means diastolic dysfunction. And what they did was they gave them uh, sildenafil and then they looked at uh, the outcome, which was exercise capacity and the clinical status. But the problem was they did not have right heart gas on these patients and they just use the echo as an estimate of their RV systolic pressures. So group four is your chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and this is a case of a patient 36 year old male who had a history of recurrent DVT. I'm going to present this case to you and uh, he developed submassive PE. He had lupus anticoagulant that was positive first uh, clot uh, in the leg uh, was in 2001 and he was treated uh, for six months with warfarin then it was taken off then he developed hemoptysis about what 14 years later and then again hemoptysis again a year later and then he was admitted to another county hospital and diagnosed with submassive PE and discharge in warfarin and after that he was started on Rio Sigward and this is his echo when he came to us you can see that severely enlarged uh, uh, rv with pressure overload severely elevated PS systolic pressure and this is a chest x-ray the heart size as you can uh, appreciate is huge that's the arrow over here the the arrow the orange arrow is showing the enlarged pulmonary artery and you can see the heart is uh, is larger than the uh, each hemi thorax if you can calculate that or measure that. CT angio is required for these patients if you're thinking of 
uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And this is what it would show, and I'll show you the, this uh, CT finding in which you can see the, uh, the aorta, which is in the middle, and the one that's white, the vessel that's white is the, is the uh, pulmonary artery, is bigger than the aorta. And you, you can see the arrow showing the clot and another clot. And these are just small clots uh, which are going all the way to distal vessels. The arrow is showing that on both sides. And uh, in the center of the screen, uh, this is huge uh, right uh, atrium and LV is also big, but not as big as the RA and the RV. Hepatic vein, the contrast is going into the uh, hepatic vein and hepatic vein is, is enlarged and you can see dilated. And this is the lung uh, view in which the lung parenchyma can be seen. And you can see that there is ground glass, which is the haziness in the lungs, which uh, is pointed out by the arrow. And again, in the previous one, you can see that the enlarged pulmonary artery, which is marked by the arrow here, enlarged much bigger than the aorta. And then the arrow points out to the to the mosaicism or the ground glass opacity which is present and it is because of the hyperperfusion of these area of the lung by the clots that I showed you before. So how do we do? What does the CT angiogram show? It showed the thrombus, dilated uh, vessels, it showed the webs um, and no acute PE. So the, what do we do next? We do a VQ scan. And I want to show you a normal VQ scan. This is the normal VQ scan in which the right lung and the left lung is present in the first image. And uh, you can see that the, the edges are very smooth and there's no interruption in the middle is the heart. So there, it's not there. The, 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 uh, the dye is not taken up by that, the radioisotope, but in, in, in the periphery is very smooth. In contrast, this patient's Perfusion scan is, shows these, these perfusion defects and with their holes and I've pointed out by the arrow that uh, multiple perfusion defects are present in both lungs. So it's not smooth perfusion as, pre, as I showed you over here. And uh, we did PFTs on this patient and reduced PFTs, diffusion capacity is reduced, the FEV1 and FEC both are reduced. The patient hardly walked to 60 meters, so it's a poor walk and oxygenation, oxygen saturation went down and patient was prescribed oxygen. Then this, this uh, does, uh, next step would be to do a pulmonary angiogram. And this is the picture of his pulmonary angiogram of this patient showing you that the vessels, you can you, you were to imagine there's something missing on the right upper lung. There's no perfusion going to that part of the lung. Also on the left lower lobe or the lower part of the left lung, there's absence of perfusion there also. So we want to know how high are the pulmonary artery pressures. And in this case, the right atrial pressure is high. The RV pressure is 70 over 14. Pulmonary artery pressure mean is 43. Wedge is high, but that could be because the right ventricle is so, uh, so dilated that it's pushing into the left ventricle. Cardiac output was not bad, but the mixed venous or the, the SVC sat is only 49%. So that's really a bad prognostic sign. So in summary, multiple clots, he has history of multiple DVTs, history of hemoptysis, submassive PE, started on anticoagulation, referred to us, diagnosed with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, with severe pulmonary hypertension, and he was referred for pulmonary endotrectomy evaluation, which means to take out the clots. He actually went through that surgery. This is an angiogram. Again, I'm just showing you another angiogram in which the, the arrow pointing to, to the narrowing of the, of the vessel and there are webs over there. And this is the patient's uh, clots that came out after the surgery, both lungs. You can see a huge amount of clots that came out from both lungs. So this is just going over chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension in which these clots uh, form the part of the uh, lung vessel wall. And so they have to have the whole 
a lung vessel wall to be removed. It's a major surgery that has to be done in order to remove it. Diagnostic criteria is the same. Not everybody who had acute PE develops it. The incidence is anywhere from 0.5% to 4%, which means out of 100 patients only with acute PE, only four of those patients will develop uh, chronic thromboembolic disease. So the, the incidence is not that uh, common. However, it is uh, a lot of it is underdiagnosed. And um, you can see over here, that the incidence anywhere usually it happens during the first year but it can happen up to two years and patients who have ctf they tend to be older than the patient who have the idiopathic or group one peh and what happens in these vessels is that they become uh, they, the vessel become clogged by these arteries and these arteries then uh, these clots and the arteries become uh, one and then there is growth uh, factors which are being produced and it leads to uh, growth of these clots and uh, a complete obstruction of these vessels. Also, there's evidence that there's a small vessels are also involved in these patients with with uh, with uh, uh, with chronic thromboembolic disease. They develop uh, small microemboli also and their plexiform lesion developed also. And there are risk factors such as uh, clotting disorders, such as uh, splenectomy, no spleen, having uh, prior clots, chronic inflama inflammatory conditions, cancer, uh, lupus anticoagulant, uh, antiphospholipid antibodies, increased level of factor eight, uh, some genetic factors also are implicated. So uh, there is no specific uh, symptom of CTAF. It is uh, you just have to think about it, especially in patients uh, who uh, have pulmonary hypertension. All of these patients should have a perfusion scan done. So this is one uh, uh, mnemonic scar, which means suspect. Then do a echo echocardiogram and a perfusion scan. To confirm it, we have to do a right heart cat or a pulmonary angiogram, and then we have to assess their risk and then determine whether surgical management or medical management is more appropriate for these patients. So there's one uh, study, uh, one uh, actually, uh, yeah, it was a study in which more like a questionnaire in which uh, people, patient, uh, physicians were asked, we participated in this PH query in which uh, everybody was asked, okay, what would you do next? So it, interestingly, in, in, in patients who, in physicians who were taking care of patients with pulmonary hypertension, only 43% uh, did not have a VQ scan, which means that why wouldn't everybody have a VQ scan at this day and age, but even in PH query, 43% did not have it. And again, the perfusion scan shows um, patchy perfusion as seen over here, and right heart cat is required. And again, pictures of, uh, of what the clots look like on a CT scan and an angiogram. So in, in summary, uh, uh, you know, it's organized uh, thrombotic obstruction of pulmonary vessels. The perfusion scan is required and uh, further hemodynamics have to be obtained for these patients to determine the best course of action to treat these patients. I'm going to skip over these studies which are happening that we are currently participating in and um, I'm going to skip over this. This is one of the studies in which uh, inhaled uh, uh, triprostanol is being used as a small inhaled device. Instead of this big device, we have a study looking at smaller device. And this study I will talk to you about.
So uh, in summary, correct diagnosis, di correct diagnosis is very important. And uh, there are treatment options for patients. Uh, in, important to determine where the patient is in terms of their disease process, how advanced they are. One of the things, the few things that we can easily do to correct is to correct their, their hypoxia, give them oxygen. If they're anemic, give them iron. If they, uh, if they, are, uh, they have arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or scleroderma, those things have to be treated because that, vasc that can also lead to pulmonary vasculitis and lead to worsening of pulmonary hypertension. If they have HIV, that HIV needs to be treated because treating HIV is going to treat their pulmonary hypertension also, and their PA pressure is going to come down. So any infl pro-inflammatory condition that these patients have, those have to be treated. And, uh, and enrolling patients in different clinical studies are important because that's how we find out how they're doing. So I would like to thank you for your attention. And, um, and um, if you have any questions or if you need a, if you want to provide any feedback, my email address is, is outlined over here. Thank you very much.